So I uh, mostly work on uh, using remote sensing to look into climate response rather than, you know, like modeling climate and, and those, those stuff. So one of the key area that uh, we work on uh, how this is impacting, say, um, for example, vegetation growth and, uh, and also, uh, say, the carbon cycle, etc. So the way it, it works is it alters the growing season for, 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 for plants, you know, like with warm springs, uh, your, your growing season become earlier, you know, like they, they start to live uh, earlier and then with warm autumn it may uh, longer the growing season. Um, so as a result, so there is an imbalance in the total carbon cycle that we, we may normally assume. So what we do is we use satellite data to monitor exactly when the growing season starts. So, so now with the re recent advancement of a lot of data available, so you can get near daily data sources um, and you exactly pinpoint when it starts and when it ends. Uh, as a result, then you, you can, from that you can infer what is the total contribution to the carbon and, and other energy uh, balance and, and so on. So that's one on the, on the natural vegetation side. When you think about crop, uh, one of the big impact of climate change on crop uh, is, uh, is when, uh, so for example, we did a study in, uh, in India a few years ago where we looked into Punjab and, and Haryana and like those, those uh, areas of green revolution and high crop production areas. And then when we, when we did some, what we found is your, the, the maximum peak of your crop growth is falling within the peak of, of springs uh, kind of temperature. So what that is having is it's uh, having an impact on the, on the grain filling because that's the when, when they start to grain fill and then when the temperature then that have a negative impact on the yield. Uh, so, so one solution was uh, you, you can move that growing season slightly, like start planting earlier so that you avoid that spring stress, what you call it, the spring stress. And only possible if we use time series of data exactly uh, which will tell you when the crop has started growing, when the, the maximum in the growing season and so on. So we use measure of greenness from, uh, from satellite data to, to monitor those, those changes. So, so when we started, so we started with, with probably more of a uh, picture of the earth, you know, like a little bit information of that. But what, what we are moving into is more and more properties. So we try to understand uh, some of the physical properties like the soil moisture, the temperature, you know, like the vegetation chlorophyll, so quite detailed properties. Yeah, the vegetation uh, structure, so, so, so that's, that's really helpful information. Uh, so again, uh, this is uh, more about uh, uh, sink rather than source, because source are, you know, like other uh, so, uh, way of emission. So how do we measure that uh, using satellite data? So what we monitor is something called the gross primary productivity. Okay, so that is the total amount that is being captured by by a vegetation or or plant, and the gross primary productivity is function of three things. One is how much radiation is coming in, so how much solar radiation. Then what is there, like how much biomass is or vegetation is there, and what are the environmental factors? So the environmental factors like. Your, your temperature and, and precipitation and so on. So, so those three components, so this is a well-established formulation from 1970s where they, they have done a lot of studies in, in laboratory conditions and so on to have this formula. So we use the satellite data to estimate the total amount of photosynthetic capacity, like how much is there. And then uh, the solar radiation uh, is also, we infer from satellite data. Uh, mostly through geostationary satellite uh, using uh, using different formulation, and and environmental conditions are taken from from land cover and typical climatic uh, type. And then when you put together all into a model, so we we get an estimation of what is the gross primary productivity of that specific location. 
And then again, you know, like when you monitor that through time, as the growing season increases or decreases, then your total amount of vegetation that is available for, for photosynthesis will decrease. And as a result, you'll find the changes in your, your carbon cycle. So there is an interesting development happening here. Uh, the, the European Space Agency, you know, like so, so they, they are launching, uh, they have launched uh, uh, a, a satellite called Sentinel uh, Satellite. So that's a program, it's a very ambitious program. So that has some specific spectral bands or spectral characteristic which can be used to measure rather than the total vegetation amount. So it can also measure what is the chlorophyll content in it. So as a result, you can infer the photosynthesis because chlorophyll is the driver of photosynthesis. Yeah, so if you have information about chlorophyll in your vegetation canopy, then you have more direct link to the photosynthesis and carbon cycle. So, so the new sensors are helping with, with that, uh, you know, like providing data in a specific spectral bands, which, which, uh, which gives you the ability to, to measure that total chlorophyll in vegetation. So the, the previous project, for example, was looking into uh, recovery after a cyclone in Odisha. Uh, and that was uh, m mostly through uh, uh, what we use is most of the farm, uh, most of the area that was hit in the cyclone were coastal Odisha where there are a lot of subsistence farmers. So they were basically relying on their fields to, to grow crops and have their living from that. Uh, the way to monitor their recovery is to see how the crop has, has returned, you know, like after the damage. So are they producing enough to the pre-cyclone level? So what we found is some areas, they, they recover in two to three years. So that was mostly uh, maybe because of policy or whatever, where their crop yield was at the same level as it was before cyclone. Whereas some areas, uh, uh, they, they never recover. So basically, they, they ended up with a lower amount of crop yield compared to what was their pre-cyclone level. So uh, here again, you know, like historical data said, uh, because the crop, so the crop information we get is a aggregated statistics, you know, like at the block level or a district level. So we never go into village level or detail areas uh, of crop production. So having remote sensing uh, data helped us to to identify those specific villages or areas where you know like they, they, they never recover after after cyclone. We went on uh, uh, to meet a lot of stakeholders and the local people and also conducted some in-depth uh, field as, uh, assessment like more of a socio-economic survey. And what we found is there are probably Two uh, two things that is that is happening. Uh, one is your permanent, um, you know, like salinization of the land. So, so as a result, uh, means they they, they never uh, uh, come back to their normal level of productivity. Uh, but the second, I think, that is the most important uh, thing is uh, is the is the policy. You know, like where uh, the government is is probably looking into very short-term solutions all the time, you know, like, so providing, say, the, the, uh, the rice or all those things with the public distribution system. But there was not a long-term uh, planning for any kind of improvement to, to those, those lands. Like, it, so, so what we saw is, is a lot of people converted their agricultural land to prawn carries. You know, like so as, as a short term, but they were not trained, you know, like trained to do prawn cultivation. So as a result, uh, after one or two years, their prawns got diseased and they, they lost both their agricultural land and also their prawn garage and they were in a poverty trap. So there was, uh, uh, so, so, so our motto was, means the government was quite good in saving lives during the cyclone, but not livelihoods, you know, like so. Uh, so they they just give you one one year or something after after any event, and then there are schemes, but they're not properly goes to people to look into long term solution. Um, uh, so for example, you know, like having research into more salt tolerant variety of of rice in that specific part of of uh, of Odisha would be useful. But 
But what we found is people are still using those traditional rice, which, which may not be suitable at the moment. So, so making them aware of what is available and how they can maintain their, their agriculture activity is also important. Okay, uh, so there are a few initiatives I, I want to uh, touch upon. So the first one is what observations we had for climate, you know, like historical observations. So they were just monitoring stations and they are sporadic across the globe, you know, like some you have one center somewhere where they have in one country, you have a lot of, lot of monitoring stations. And the way they collect and report those data were, were not up to the same standard. So, so that's why their argument about the quality of those data and how accurate those things. So, so the development of satellite technology, I think from 1980s onward, so we, we have a clear record of, of some key climate parameters like your sea surface temperature, land surface temperature, you know, like some of the atmospheric properties and so on. And uh, so what we are doing uh, as at, at the European level is uh, we are try trying to establish uh, something called a climate change initiative, like a climate data record. So you try to put all the sensors and all the satellite data that were acquired from 1980s and then come up with a unified record of these observations. And then what you get is rather than single monitoring station, so we have a global picture of how the temperature is changing, you know, like, and then, for example, which area is becoming more hotter, or which area is becoming cooler, and so on. And no one can argue about the validity of the data set. So the consistency in the approach of collecting this data through satellite gives kind of more confidence to, to people who are arguing or, or kind of saying that this is, this is happening. So that's kind of one uh, major uh, major thing. And then as we go along into the future, so that the data would be more richer in time. And then, you know, like, so now we have nearly 35, 40 years of data. So which is a good record with a global coverage. Uh, and then so that, that gives you more confidence. The second, in terms of adaptation, I think the major is, is in your uh, monitoring deforestation, for example. So we have we have more uh, a, a new techniques using microwave sensors, so which can give you information in in a dense forest uh, system as well. Uh, what is the forest density and so on? And and another aspect is 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 also looking you know like your degradation. So so there are two aspects in the red. So which is deforestation and degradation. So nothing has been done much on degradation aspects of it and then how that links into total carbon accounting system. So, so also uh, a, a detailed record of degradation would help uh, in, in providing those numbers accurately.